it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you have hands, who has hands? Lift them. Now can we clap them like this? Now the words that are on the screen is let the redeemed of the Lord say so. They're going to fix it and say let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Now I want everybody that's in the room, if you feel that God has called you here this morning, you didn't wake up on your own, you didn't get here on your own, God brought you here. I want to encourage you to worship God this morning and sing it out with this. Though it may feel weird, though it may not be your style, I want you to say it this morning. And as we sing that, I believe the glory of the Lord is going to come in. So let's say it together. Hey, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord If you're still sitting in your seat not worshiping, this is the time for you to do it. 
showing up in different areas, you might feel even confused about it. Why do I feel such a pull to be with God, but also a pull to be like other people? I've been there. Growing up in church, it's hard because you see so many kids, so many teenagers, they get away with everything. It seems like you can never get away with anything. But it's because, and I was told this when I was younger, it was because there are people that have been set apart God has a call and he's not going to let you get away with certain things. It's because there's so much on your life, Isaiah, and it, it's, I'm not even saying you have to be like your dad. You don't. You can, whatever God has for you is for you. But I just wanted to say that. I just got a picture of your face in my mind when we were singing together and I just wanted to deliver that to you. I don't know if it makes sense. It doesn't. Just let it go. But if it does, just talk to the Lord about that. Because He is passionately in love with you. He, man, I'm, I'm serious. I'm not saying this because your dad's ministering. I'm saying this because it was on my heart. Seriously. Thank you, Jesus. Don't you guys love worshiping God? lift up our hands all across this room and maybe this is a foreign stance to you 
And if it feels weird, come enough times it won't feel weird anymore. <laughs> Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, captivate our hearts this day. God, I pray for peace of mind on those who feel chaotic. I pray for hope for those who feel distant and hopeless. God, you're not far away, you are here. The only thing that you ask is that we draw near and you will come near to us. Holy Spirit, fill this room with your glory. Let every hearer receive the message for today. We submit ourselves to you, Holy Spirit. We say, do what you want to do. Speak to us what you want to speak. Whether it's uncomfortable, whether it's foreign, God, we give you this room. We give you our hearts. We give you our ears. We say, take over, Holy Spirit. Take over, Lord. Amen. You know, as we are worshiping right now and even praying before service, I felt in my spirit the word prepare, 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 prepare. And we've been in this series on supernatural, but I believe that God is preparing his people for a supernatural wave to be released. But we have to position ourselves and posture ourselves in a manner that is not only ready to receive his power and his glory, but to be vessels and carriers of that glory. In my mind, visually, I saw a page being turned, and I believe that there are quite a few people here in this place that you feel like you have been stuck in a chapter of your life that you just can't get past. You just can't turn to the next page, and you felt like, well, maybe my story is done being written. But I believe that the Spirit of God would remind you that He is still at work in your life. He is still writing a new thing, that your story has not stopped. Although there may be a delay, the supernatural is about to flow in your life. If you would simply posture yourself and position yourself, knowing and understanding that as long as God is our priority, then all things are possible. As long as Jesus is in the forefront of our lives, then all things can work together for the good of those that love him. And I believe that God is trying to remind some people in this place today that the story has not stopped, but it is just getting started. For a past that was riddled with feeling broken down, busted, disgusted, a past that you felt like you were never going to break free of addiction, a past where a divorce was in your family as being erased and rewritten by our prioritization of God, I believe that there is something supernatural taking place, not only in this house, but in the body of Christ. If you and I would simply posture ourselves and position Jesus where he needs to be, and that is number one in each and every one of our lives. I believe that God is looking to pour out his power upon all flesh. The Bible says that, but it requires us to posture ourselves in a way that says, God, I can't do it, but I surrender my life to you because you can do it. God wants to give you strength. God wants to rejuvenate you. God wants to remind you that there is a purpose and a plan for your life but we have to acknowledge him and keep him in his proper place. We have to be led by his presence and do everything from his presence. And that's when his power and glory show up. You know, in the Bible, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, how many of us know that there were hundreds of years between the two being written? And that wasn't that God was dead, that God wasn't inactive, but God was waiting because sometimes God has to allow us to sit in a little bit of silence, feeling like nothing's going on, feeling like we're not hearing anything to remind us that he is still God. And so if you are in a season where you feel like there has been silence, there is a season where you have lacked direction, there is a season where you feel stuck and that things aren't changing, I just wanna remind you that God is still writing your story and that a new chapter is on its way, amen. And so I know normally we, we do things a little bit backwards this morning, but I really felt to share that in my spirit. If I have not had the opportunity to meet you, my name is Ben. This is my wife, and we are the assistant pastors here at the Cure Church, Kansas City. Our apostle and our co-lead pastor, Pastor Esther, are away on their sabbatical right now. We are praying rest, refreshment, rejuvenation, and believing for fresh vision to be poured out in their lives. Amen. And so be praying for them. Be praying that God continues to allow them to relax and sit back a little bit. But man, we're going to have an amazing service this morning. We have Pastor Louis Kelso. He is the lead pastor of our Lee Summit Church. 
And man, it's going to be an amazing time. But I encourage all of you to turn around and find somebody that you may not know or you don't interact with and tell them good morning and get ready for service. Amen. sweater weather. I like sweater weather. But you know what else it is? And you're from the Midwest, and I know you're not going to be able to answer this question, so let me tell you myself. It's hurricane season. It starts in June, but it's predominantly more active in the fall, especially in the months of September and October. And you know, being from the East Coast, or from the South to be exact, I'm more acquainted with both hurricanes and tornadoes. See, the National Weather Service estimates in a three-year period an average of five hurricanes strike the United States coastline. And typically, two of those hurricanes become major hurricanes. See, in September 22nd, 1989, myself and my family went through Hurricane Hugo. And I can still remember to this day how loud the wind was howling and how hard the rain was beating down on our home. I remember watching trees bending back and forth, touching the ground, snapping back up. Some of those same trees would break because they could not withstand the constant beating. There were blue lights going off in the sky everywhere we were watching transformers blow out then after about four or five hours of relentless rain and wind it was calm we were in the eye of the storm I think it took about eight to ten hours for Hugo to finally pass us by but that eye lasted about 45 minutes and then the wind started to pick up again the rain started to come down and here came the back half of that storm See, hurricanes are about 300 miles wide and they move slowly. So that was eight to 10 hours of relentless wind and rain beating down on nature and on individuals' homes. See, up until 2019, Hurricane Hugo held the record as the easternmost Category 5 hurricane in the Atlantic. The scale and the immensity of damage that this hurricane caused led the NOAA to retire the name Hugo from the Atlantic hurricane list of names that could be used. Why am I telling you about hurricanes this morning? See, I told God the other day, as I often do, Lord, speak to me in your word. And I opened my Bible and it was the book of Job. And I am not going to lie, immediately my heart sank and I asked myself, what did you just ask for? See, the Bible says that Job was an upright, righteous man with an impeccable reputation, a large family, and great wealth. And as I began reading it, it was the chapters where Job is arguing his case back and forth with his friends. Because in, while Job's responses began to speak out to me, and in Job's self-righteousness, in his self-confidence, he was questioning God like how a lawyer would question someone because of the violent storm of life he was in. Job wanted to put God on the witness stand to explain to him why 
He had to endure the hurt and pain that was clearly unjust. Why his children had to die so young. Why he had to endure the pain and agony of a disease that debilitated him every single day. Why God permitted the wicked to prosper while the righteous suffered. Why did he have to face bankruptcy? Have you ever questioned God's ways? Have you ever held bitter memories and disappointments against God? Have you felt trapped or abandoned by God in a violent storm of problems and pressures? See, as I was about to end my reading, I heard the Lord tell me, go read my responses to Job. So I flipped it over a couple pages and I came to Job 31.8. And the Lord said, and now finally, God answered Job from the eye of a violent storm. Why do you talk without knowing what you're talking about? I have some questions for you, Job, and I want some straight answers. Where were you when I created the earth? Tell me, since you know so much. Who decided on its size? Certainly you'll know that. Who came up with the blueprints and measurements? How was its foundation poured and who set the cornerstone? And have you ever ordered morning get up and told dawn to get to work? Do you know the first thing about death? Do you have one clue regarding da uh, death's dark mysteries? And do you have any idea how large the earth is? Speak up if you have even the beginning of an answer. Do you know where light comes from and where darkness lives? So you can take them by the hand and lead them home when they get lost? Why, of course you know that. You've known them all your life, grown up in the same neighborhood with them see what I read here is just the tip of the iceberg God relentlessly continues his questioning of Job in chapter 39 40 and 41 he questions him about the universe about nature and about strength all of God's relentless questioning of Job was for one purpose to show Job God's sovereignty in all things see this morning I'm talking to us that have been here if you've been here six months or longer we have to get to a point where we can take God talking to us the way that he talked to Job God should not have to baby us in everything his word says in everything that he is asking us to do even when it comes to your finances he does not want to treat you like an infant he wants you to hear his voice and respond Respond as an adult would or as your children would respond to you as an adult see after reading all God's responses to Job I had to repent for my for arrogantly and ignorantly questioning God and his sovereignty because I've been in the violent storms in marriage with my children with our businesses and our finances and I've acted as if my knowledge and my ways were greater than his and it was shown through my disobedience to him and his word see what qualifies us to contend with God's wisdom justice and power his sovereignty which one of us is able to tell the beginning from the end which one of us is able to feed every living thing on earth which one of us is able to make all things everywhere always work to the good See, all of Job's arrogant, overconfident protest fell silent the day that God answered him. Job 43 through 5 says, Job answered, I'm speechless in awe, words found me. I should have never opened my mouth. I've talked too much, way too much. I'm ready to shut up and listen. Are you ready to quiet your mouth, quiet your soul, quiet your spirit, and listen to the voice of God this morning? See, Job's place was not to question or reason with God what he did not understand, but to submit to him who is eternally sovereign. See, our part is to submit to the one whose ways are beyond our full comprehension. This morning, church, we have to get back to the place of understanding that God is sovereign. Isaiah 44, 24 says, God alone is the creator of everything. He's sovereign over the heavens. He's sovereign over the earth and all that is in it. He's sovereign sovereign over mountains he's sovereign over oceans he's sovereign over nature and let me tell you this morning he's sovereign over the storm over the physical storms that rage on the earth and over our storms that rage in our own personal lives you know what else he's also sovereign over all the gold and silver exactly we don't want to hear that but can I remind you this morning God's sovereign over your money 
He's sovereign over what you have in your pocket and he's sovereign over what you have sitting in your bank account. See, there's a greater that God wants to release in this house. He doesn't just want to manifest his power in signs, wonders, and miracles. He wants to release wealth because it will be needed to sustain the move of God that is coming to this house. Who knows if we'll have to go to multiple services? Who knows if we'll have to get a bigger facility? But I can tell you that this morning, God ain't going to drop money out of heaven. He's looking for vessels that he can use. He needs people he can trust with the riches of his kingdom people who will steward money correctly for his purposes see to be a good steward you have to be obedient to his word you can't withhold what rightfully belongs to him what rightfully belongs to God monetarily the tithe and most of us know that but can I tell you this morning it ain't just the tithe anything that God's asking from you belongs to him and he has a purpose for it see God isn't asking us to give everything, but I know he's not asking us to withhold this morning either. Do you understand that by stewarding finances correctly, you will reap and enjoy the benefits of God's blessing also? In chapter 42, you read that Job learned the lesson of the storm, that God alone is sovereign in all things. And once he learned that lesson, Job 42.10 says that God restored Job's fortune, then doubled it. Job 42.12 says that God blessed Job's latter life even more than his earlier life. And Job 42.16-17 through 17 says, Job lived on another 140 years living to see his children and grandchildren four generations of them then he died an old man a full life God's plan for us is a full life I don't know what storm you're in this morning I know there's an economic uh, economic storm in in the world that we live in but can I tell you God's sovereign on it over it there's no storm that can stop his provision there's no gates of hell that can stop his command to bless the only person that has the ability to stop God is you and me and this morning we have the opportunity to give God and to be a steward over the mind that he's blessed you with can you step out of God's way this morning and not do it your way can you not give God out of repetition this morning because you know he sees that he saw everything that Job was saying can you step out of the repetition of your giving this morning and actually hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you maybe he's gonna tell you it's time to give the tithe back Maybe he's reminding you to fulfill your vow for heart for the cure. Maybe he's going to challenge you to remove the limitations in your generosity and give what you think is not possible. I don't personally know what he's going to say to each one of you in here this morning, but my prayer is that he finds you obedient and trustworthy. As the hosts come forward, if you need an offering envelope to give, if you can raise your hand, they'll gladly give you one. There's ways to give behind me on the screen. You can text to give if you're watching online. Be a part of what God is doing, not just in this church, but in your life personally. As we take a minute to fill out the envelopes, I know it's weather weather, but it feels like 95 degrees up here right now. Maybe I should have put on a tank top and some sandals. Woo! Jesus. It's the lights. <laughs> Please don't sweat my makeup off and reveal my beard. Help me, Lord, with age. I'm just kidding. I don't have a beard. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Maybe not. Kind of. Sort of. No, I'm really kidding. Jesus, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your compassion. 
God, we thank you that you have reminded us this morning that you are sovereign, God. That there is not one thing that passes by that you do not see. That there is one word that you do not hear, God. Lord, you know every situation that each one of us is in, oh God. And you love us through that situation. But God, you're asking us to grow and mature and increase in our faith, God, for the work that you're about to release on this house, God. So Lord, Lord, we say to you this morning that we repent for arrogantly and ignorantly questioning your sovereignty, God. Lord, we ask, God, that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out in this house because we declare and we decree that we will be good stewards of the finances that you release, Lord. We love you. We honor you, God. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name, if you could bring your offering up to the baskets. Hey everyone, welcome to The Cure Church. My name is Carla and I serve on The Cure Kids team. Here at The Cure, we exist to see the sickness of sin cured by the power of Jesus. Our online and in-person services are Sundays at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Child care is provided at every service for ages eight weeks to 12 years old. If you we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen realm. Against mighty powers in this dark world. And against evil spirits in the heavenly places. This is the supernatural. Amen. Well, good morning and good morning. And if I have not had the opportunity again, my name is Ben. My wife and I are the assistants here. But thank you guys so much for partnering with us and giving. I do have the opportunity to introduce our speaker for this morning. But real quick, um, I had, didn't get the chance to, to formally meet him. But we have some of our In the Light family with us, I believe. Are you here? Where are you at? Anybody? Right there, in the middle. I'm putting you right on blast, bro. Here, Elvis, right? Good to have you. That is our family, guys. That is from In the Light Ministries, Pastor Jamie uh, Centeno and his wife. Uh, they're dear friends of our, of our network here and amazing, amazing people. So he is in town visiting his daughter, correct? Amen. So make sure that y'all talk to him, hook him up, tell him to go get barbecue and all that. And we'll debate the barbecue is better than Phillies. Can we do that? Is that too soon, guys? Amen. But no, I do have the, the honor and privilege to introduce our speaker. You know, he has known our apostle and our pastors for 20 years now, and he is part of the board here of the Cure Church Kansas City, the founding church, the sending church. Uh, and I know that today is going to be amazing, not only because we're in this awesome series on the supernatural, but also because he is a Jayhawks fan. About seven of you are in here, that's all right. But I know that y'all are going to be stoked because not only do y'all win national titles, but for the first time in I don't even know how many years, KU bat football is ranked in the top 25 this morning. They are 4-0, oh, so I already know he's going to come off the fire on that. He already brings the fire, but give him a little bit of zest and zeal with some good KU football and the fact that the Chiefs are about to lay the pound down on the Colts. I already know he's going to bring forth an amazing message. So can we stand and show honor and appreciation as Pastor Lewis comes forward from the Cure Church Lee Summit. Now come on, somebody. Give God some praise in the house of the Lord. Come on. Come on, just stand on your feet for just a minute. Amen. I am so incredibly honored. To be here this morning, amen, and my church, the Cure Church, Lee Summit, send their greetings, my wife, amen, and God is doing an amazing work in Lee Summit right now. Uh, the Spirit of God is moving, people are being healed, delivered, set free. It is just amazing, amen, what God is doing. I, I want to honor my apostle, my pastor, amen, like Pastor Ben said, I've, I've been in this network for 20 years. I've never been in any other church, ever. I got saved here and stayed here. Amen. 
So I want to honor them, amen, for allowing me to come and grace this amazing pulpit on this Sunday morning. And I just have to say this, amen. Um, I don't know where she's at. Uh, where'd your wife go? She's in the back. Where, oh, I honor you. Thank you for being obedient to God with that word. That was more on point and confirmation than you'll ever know, amen. So thank you so much, amen, for not letting anything stop you from releasing that word but being obedient to God, amen. Come on, somebody. Let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this morning, Lord, for your grace, your mercy. I thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that is manifest in this place. I pray, Lord God, that as we come hungry, God, that you would fill us this morning. That none of us will walk out of this place lacking, limited in any capacity or in any way. But, Father, we pray the fullness of the power of God. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that if you would, just, just help me, Lord, this morning. Give me grace. Give me mercy, Lord God, to minister your word. Fill me with your Holy Spirit like never before. And let everyone in this place, God, walk out of this place different than the way we came in. We thank you this morning. We give you all the praise, honor, and every bit of the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, will somebody give him praise this morning? Come on, do better than that, amen. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. I am excited. I'm on a whole nother note, man. KU, hallelujah. Come on, I, man, not my wildest dreams. Amen, that I think that I will see them ranked ever again, but hallelujah. God is doing a work, amen. Jesus is coming back, hallelujah. Listen, this, this morning, I just want to minister for a few moments on the supernatural power of honor. The supernatural power of honor. I know that this is an honoring church. I know that's something that we believe in as a network, and I know the groundwork has been laid. Uh, it's one of our values, and uh, it's one of the cultures and what we're trying to establish and believe in this entire network. And I think what's powerful about the creation of a culture that we want to establish, not in just this church, but in our entire network. And if you don't know, man, we have an amazing network of churches. Amazing network, meaning that this is not a singular lone church here in Kansas City, Kansas, but we have churches in Lee Summit. We have churches in Lawrence. We have it in Leavenworth. We have churches in Chicago. We have them all over the place, amen. And we make up a nucleus of power and see the, you know, the sickness of sin cured by Jesus, amen. And we're creating this culture. And, and it was powerful about the culture that we're creating is that people will walk in years from now and they will walk in not having to be told or taught. They'll just begin to see it and work it in action that we are an honoring church and an honoring network. Amen? And it'll be something that is reflected in the action of the body of Christ. Amen? Now, culture, and what I want to talk about this morning, is created, and just hear me for just a few moments, it's created in its birth out of both what we allow and don't allow. Now, stay with me just a few moments, amen. Just like anything else in the spiritual, it's allow and what we don't allow. The moment we come and say, we're not going to allow dishonor to take place any longer. And I'm talking about up, down, all around. I'm talking, we're not allowing you to dishonor one another. We're not going to allow you to dishonor the man and woman of God. We're not going to allow you to dishonor the new person who came in this morning. We're not going to allow that. The moment we take a stand and say, I won't allow dishonor to take place is the moment we're creating a culture that we believe honor is valued. So it comes to a point where we say, no, we're, we're only allowing honor to flow forward. We're only allowing honor to be revealed in who we are and our actions and deeds. We are a people of honor, amen? And honor, listen, is supernatural because you can't expect to see signs, wonders, and miracles when you create an atmosphere of dishonor in the house. God don't show up like that. And I'm going to get there. I'm kind of good in the hood of myself. I'm being here, amen. This is, this is where I got saved at. Some of you don't know me. I don't know you. I've never seen you before. But, but you no, know, that was my spiritual father for anyone else. So I've been here a long time. Now, what God is looking for is he's looking for men, women, and even teenagers who will spearhead a movement of honor in the house. Because an honoring church is always a healthy church, Amen. Let's look at it like this. I heard artists said before that honor is kingdom currency, begging to be spent. Spoil people with honor. 
Give it all away. Go bankrupt. Invest all you can because when even people don't notice your honor, heaven does. And I listen, and when it comes to that, when I understand the realization, I don't care if you notice how I honor as long as my heavenly father does. Amen? I just do what God life when we're tempted to speak death. Honor intercedes for others instead of gossiping and complaining. Honor builds up instead of tears down. Honor submits instead of rebelling. We cannot be a presence-driven church. We cannot be a present-driven network void of honor. If honor's not here, the Holy Spirit ain't either. If the, listen, Holy Spirit, amen? And listen, now honor is simply this. When you look at definitions, it's basically just this. It's to regard or treat someone with admiration and respect. And the Word of God speaks so much on this particular subject. The first thing we need to understand is this, that honor reflects the kingdom. Honor reflects the kingdom. And because honor reflects the whole entire kingdom, it can never be one directional. Now, there's an order to honor. Somebody say order. There's, there's an order, amen, because we serve a God of order. Come on, this is a house of order. We don't just do whatever we want to do. We want the order and the honor of God, amen. So when we think of always, goes to God. We don't honor people above God. We don't honor possessions above God. We don't honor ourselves above God. First and foremost, we honor God. Amen? That's a good place to give God a little praise right now. Because when we can properly honor God, then we can honor the things God has placed in our lives. And when I honor God, then I can honor my wife. When I, when I honor God, then I can honor my children. It's, because I'm a steward of them, because God gave them to me. When I honor God, I got to honor everything God has placed in my life. And when we honor God, guess what? Here's the power of that. When I honor God, guess what? Honor always comes back. Boomerang. When you throw honor out, guess what? Honor comes right back to you. I've heard it said a long time ago, man, when I was a young disciple, I heard a guest speaker say that, you know, when we honor God, God will honor us. And I thought, is that true? But that is the word of God. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, but I will honor those who honor me, who think lightly of me. Now, there's a weightiness to this because the weight of the word of God is so powerful. When we honor God, God will honor in return, amen? And why do we honor God? We honor God just because he's God. When you're looking for reasons to honor God, you've already missed it. Why should I honor? Because he's God. Because he created everything we see. He created you. We honor God because one time, 2,000 years ago, he sent an only begotten son. And he sent a son who lived a sinless life, was murdered for us. Let's call it what it is. But got back up after three days, defeated death, hell, and a grave, established a new covenant that we can be saved. That's why we honor God this morning. Because he's faithful, he's amazing, he's powerful, he healed your body, he restored your marriage, he touched your children. Listen, God needs to be honored. And when we say, God, I honor you above anything else, then God says, I'm in the right place then. I can move in this atmosphere, I can move in your life because you've decided above anything and everything else you honor me. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31 says, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That one scripture is so amazing, so powerful. I began to share with some of the men in my church, and I said, man, whatever we think about this, if we can take on the mindset that whatever I do, whether I'm eating, drinking, going to work, amen, dealing with this or doing that, if I do it all with the mindset that I do it all for the glory of God, I'm honoring God. I'm honoring God in everything I do. It's real hard to do dumb stuff when you have this mindset. It's real hard to have road rage. And I got to think about that when I'm driving sometimes because I'd be tempted. Because you know what? Why do people drive slow in that left lane? I'm just like, I don't understand. I got to get to church. Get out of the window. Lord, I'm sorry. 
or work or Burger King or wherever the place may be. I'm just in a rush. But listen, so whatever you do, whatever it is, eating, do it all for the glory of God so we can honor God. Amen? Now, let me throw this in. Uh, uh, Sister Crystal did an amazing, amazing message. Amazing message on giving. I was taking mental notes. I'm like, I just may invite her just to do it at my, just that. Just invite her to my church and you do just what you just did right now. Listen, but let me throw this out there. We need to honor God, amen? But we honor God in all kind of things. Also our money. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth. With the first fruits of all your produce, amen? Now there's nothing in, no one should be honored more than God. But God tells us, God tells us that we are called to honor certain things. We honor God first and foremost, but he also says, listen, there's some things you're called to honor. There's people, there's institutions, there's leadership, there's things that you're called to honor. The Bible says that we're called to honor our parents. Now, I know some of your parents are like, yeah, where's my kid at? But listen, it doesn't give an age limit to when that breaks off. It doesn't matter if you have kids or grandkids, you still honor your parents, Amen. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. It doesn't specify whether your parents are saved or not. It just says honor. The Bible says in Romans 13, 1, everyone, somebody say everyone. Everyone, everyone must submit to governing authorities. Everyone. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Honoring governing authorities means presidents. Let that sink in for a minute. I didn't lose my place. I knew exactly where I'm at. I just want to. Mayors. Police officers, teachers, it's a four-letter word, but it's not a cuss word. Your boss, now wait a minute, that person ain't saved, they don't know what they're doing, I feel persecuted at work with my boss, listen. Again, the Bible does not say that we are called to honor those who we like, those who treat us well, those who believe what we believe. Again, the Bible just says honor. Now, when we begin to get this, the supernatural begins to flow. Because you wonder why you're not making an impact at work. You wonder why your light is so dim at work. It's because you thought you had a reason to be dishonorable because they're not saved. Maybe, just maybe, God is trying to use your light and your life through your honor and your love for people that are not saved to bring them into the kingdom of God. You want, come on somebody, we have what no one else has. We have the gospel. We have Jesus. So whatever we do, wherever we go, amen, just like the scripture says, whether we're dealing with bosses or, or mayors or police officers or teachers or whatever, we are called to be the light of the world. And when we honor, we're telling them, I'm different. I'm not like the rest of the world. I want people to see the Jesus inside of us, amen? But they won't see Jesus inside of us. They'll just see the rest of the world, how the rest of the world does when we dishonor just like everyone else does. But the moment we shift it and say, I'm going to honor when you don't deserve to be honored. I'm going to honor just because the Bible tells me to honor. Something changes, amen? The Bible even says to honor your marriage. Hebrews 13, 4 says, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Now, honor is not limited to just these few specific things, church. Because when honor is spiritual... It touches every spiritual aspect of our life. Amen? We honor God's word. We honor God's will. We honor God's way. And when we do this, honor goes beyond a feeling and turns into an action. The honor we have for God, for each other, for the pastors God has put in our life has to be not reactional but actional. 
meaning that I don't give honor based on what someone does. Is somebody with me this morning? Honor is not released or given just simply based on what someone does or does not do. My honor is always just actional and not reactional. I'm going to do it just because the word of God says so, amen? When you show honor to others, what you're really doing is this. You're saying, God, I honor you. Let me say it again. Honor is never one directional. It's multi-directional, meaning honor doesn't only go up. must also go out, and it must even go down. If honor in any organization is one directional, it's incomplete. James in his epistle says, God is calling every one of us to be complete, lacking nothing. Amen? When we honor, it does create the right atmosphere that God is able to move in. Listen, when I come to church, I don't, I don't, I don't simply just want the word to go forward alone. When I, when I pray, I say, God, I, I, I know I'm going to come and I'm going to preach your word. But, Lord, I want to see a manifestation of your presence. I want to see God at work. Amen. I want to see God in action. I don't just want to simply talk about miracles but not see miracles. I, I don't simply want to talk about how God can do this or do that, restore family, do, but not see it actually happen. I want to see God at work. So we try really, really hard, amen, to make sure that we're honoring God when we come into his house. We want to make sure that we're honoring one another. We want to create the atmosphere that God says, I can move in this. So you can plant a seed, but don't mean it's going to grow. You can plant a seed, don't mean it's going to grow. When I was little, I tried to do I tried to plant a seed. And it was all dirty and cracked up. And, and I was like, well, there's a crack in the ground. I could put a seed right there, thinking one day the seed will bring forth light. But who knows that it creates or needs the right atmosphere to create something, to create that seed to break open and spring forth life. You need, you need the right soil, meaning that the groundwork has to be laid. You, you need the right sunlight, the water. All these things have to take place in order for that seed to break forth and bring forth life. Well, guess what's the same in the house of the Lord? If everything is not coming together to create the right atmosphere for God to heal your body, for God to do the miracle you need him to do, then guess what? It might not happen. When you come in here, you don't come in here with a spirit of dishonor. You come in here with a spirit of honor and everything God wants to do. Whether it's your first time, whether you've been here a long time, we come and say, I want to have a heart of honor, amen? So we want that atmosphere. We want the atmosphere of honor. And honor is simply just this, amen? And I'm, I'm going to get here. The, the honor is simply, it's a byproduct of value. What am I saying? I'm saying you honor what you value. And I'll show you what it looks like to value and not value. I'll show you what it looks like to honor and dishonor. Listen, in Jesus' last week, he was, he was anointed twice as he got ready to enter into the meat and potatoes of his ministry. And the Bible says in John chapter 12, verse 1 through 8, it says that six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with a fragrance. So we have this story here where this woman is willing to pour out, empty out, something of great value. Hear me. Something of great value to a person who held even greater value in her life. So what happens is when, when you have something of value, you understand that Jesus is of greater value, you have no problem giving that thing to Jesus. I don't, I don't know. I'm not talking about money alone, but what has value in your life? My wife, my children, they hold value in my life. But God is of greater value, so I'm willing to give my family, my children, my wife, my everything to God because he's of what? Greater value. I'm willing to put anything I have that I value into the hands of God. And this is what this woman is doing. Now, Mary and Martha knew what it was to prepare someone, to anoint someone for burial. They did so for their brother Lazarus. But the Bible says in verse 4 that Judas Iscariot, the disciple, who was soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. 
All right, so she anoints him. She does so, giving what she held value and esteem and said, you have greater value, so I'm pouring it all out before you. The second time he's anointed is recorded in both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, and it takes place now two days before Passover. The first was six days. Now this is two days before Passover. And the Bible says in Matthew 26, verse 6, it says that meanwhile Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it now over his head. The first over his feet, now over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste! It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, replied, why well, criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. I tell you the truth, whatever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. I want to show you a theme, church. Both of the writers make sure to mention that it was one time that Judas alone made this statement that why would she do such a thing? Why would she pour out something of such great value in a moment like this when it could have been given to all these poor people? Not that he was concerned about poor people. But he said, man, if we would have sold this, I could have had a lot of money to myself. Another, the Bible talks about how not only Judas, but multiple disciples complained to themselves. They wouldn't dare say it to Jesus' face, but they complained to themselves. Why did he allow this to happen? His money could have been given to the poor, on and on and on. Now, let me show you what's going on here. In, the, in this time, this is why they thought it was so wasteful. That's why I thought, man, she's being extra. They're being extra because in this time it was customary. If you, if you know the Bible, when you come from long journeys, you wash your hands and wash your feet. It was customary, right? They had, they had these jars and they would, they would wash their hands, wash their feet to prepare themselves for whatever fellowship they were having. Now, if you came and you were, you know, of a higher status and you're feeling a little, little extra, what you would do is with that water that people would be having their feet washed in and hands washed in, they would put in a drop or two. Of perfume just a drop or two anything above that you're being wasteful but when you're feeling like man you know I really want to honor who's coming to my house I have it I'm gonna put a drop or two of this perfume into the water so when they're washing their hands or feet they'll smell say oh wow did you put a drop or two of that man thank you for honoring me and they will put a drop or two but these women the woman who anointed his head the woman who anointed his feet they didn't put a drop or two. They gave it all. Yes, sir. What, am I, what am I saying? I'm saying that when you honor something of greater value, you don't give some diluted honor. You don't give watered down honor. You give honor to the highest, amen. You don't do just a little bit. You go all out. And this is what these women did. They said, I'm not going to, how can I give just a little honor to Jesus? How can I give just a little bit of honor to Jesus? I'm going to give all the honor he deserves, and he deserves all of it because of who he is. These are moments that we have to understand that my honor has to go above and beyond what I see other people honoring in. My honor has to go above me. I, I don't care if that's the honor you give. I'm going above and beyond. Amen? What they used to anoint Jesus, it was expensive. The Bible talks about here is, is a year's worth of wages. And it don't matter how much you make a year, that's a lot of money. Whether you make 20000 a year or 100000 a year, whatever you make per year, that's a lot of money. But they said, man, of greater value than what I have in my hand, my possession, is Jesus. He holds a greater value in my life. And the issue was simply this. It wasn't that the disciples cared that much for the poor people. The issue was this. They didn't care enough about Jesus. They undervalued Jesus. The people closest to him didn't value him enough. And the lack of value, guess what? It caused a lack of honor. A lack of value will create a lack of honor. So I have a question. Do you value one another in this church? Do you value your brothers and sisters, the people that are there with you, your Barnabases, your, your leaders, amen, those that God has prepared you to lead, amen? Do you honor one another? Just friends. Do you honor one another? Do you value one another? Because if you value one another, you will honor one another. You will. It'll be a byproduct of it. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and 10 says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. 
Come on. The only time where it's okay to compete in the kingdom is in honor. Not for selfish reasons, not for a pat on the back. Look what I did. But simply because these are God's people. You did what? Well, I'm going to do even greater. You honor me this how? I'm going to honor you even greater. The Bible says it outdo one another in showing honor. 1 Peter 2, 17 says, honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Come on, do we value one another? But let me take it even deeper. Do you honor the gifts that God has put in your life? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Can I tell you something? Paul makes it clear that apostles, pastors, what you have going on here in the five-fold ministry, even evangelists, they're gifts. God gave them as gifts to equip you for what God wants to do in your life. Now, my pastors, Pastor Kelly, Pastor Esther, it's an amazing couple. There's an amazing call of God on their lives. They haven't fulfilled their call. They're still operating in their call, and they're going to do greater things. But when you think about their lives, listen, God put them here to help you, to bless you. They do it by loving you. They do it by caring about you, even when they don't feel the same care in return. They pray with you, cry with you, make themselves available to you. You need to honor that. You need to honor them. Because to dishonor the gift is to dishonor God. Do you know in all the Bible, the only place where it commands us to give double honors in regard to those who God has given to lead us? The only place where it says give double honor. It says in 1 Timothy 5, 17, and let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of what? Double honor. Especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So Paul begins to point out in his letter to his son in the faith, Timothy, who led the church in Ephesus, that double honor was to be given to those who led well and those who worked and labored in preaching and in teaching. Your pastors, your apostles, listen, they lead well. But can I tell you something? They don't only lead well, they lead very well. They've committed their lives to doing the will of God. And that includes a ton of sacrifice, not for their own sake, but for yours. And I never understood the level of sacrifice it takes to pastor church until I became a pastor. And when you see your kids, amen, falling asleep on pews and your kids falling asleep at, at tables at restaurants because we're fellowship, we're hanging out, we're ministering, we're discipling, we're counseling, we're doing all these things. According to Paul, you're supposed to give double honor because not only do they lead well, they also labor in the word and doctrine. And even if, even if you're saying, well, you know, that's what they're supposed to do. Okay, well, what are you supposed to do? You're called to give double honor. And if you say, well, I, I don't know, man, like I haven't been privy to all those things in my life. I'm new here. But listen, the Bible talks about if we don't honor for any other reason, we're still honored because of the office God has given them. The off, just office alone. Their pastors, their apostles are honored just because of that. Just because of who God has called them to be. Amen? Now, as I bring this down to a close, I, I was reminded of a story in 1 Samuel with Hannah. And I want to talk about, about this honor, this supernatural honor that brings forth miracles and breakthroughs. This woman, Hannah, was a barren woman. But who knows that God can move in barren areas? Come on, it don't matter how barren you think your life is right now. God has the ability to move in barren areas of your life. This is a woman who was being ridiculed, who was being talked about, amen. I mean, she's every year they go with their family to, the, to Jerusalem for sacrifices, yearly sacrifices. And every time she goes up, she's praying, she believes in God. And, and this other woman is making fun of her, ridiculing her, you know, telling her you're, you're nothing because you can't have kids. Her husband doesn't understand. He tells her, like, what does it matter? Am, am I better than ten sons? No, you're not. You're not better than ten sons. I want a baby. Come on, husbands, get it together. Oh, Elkina, come on, man. And she's like, you just don't get it. And, and, and she, she, she breaks away from, from the family. She goes and she just wants to be alone with the Lord. She's praying. Hear me, church. She's pouring her heart out before the Lord. 
She's bawling her eyes out. She's praying. It gets to the point where she's praying, but nothing's coming out. That's how much she's emptied herself out. The priest, who's supposed to be the man of God, sees her. In the midst of her anguish, she's praying, she's pouring her heart out, and he approaches her in the midst of her prayer time. And he says, are you drunk? Come on, who's ever read it? Are you drunk? Put I me mean, not, not even questioning, like, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure yet. He said, hey, get rid of that Coors Light. Get, put your wine away from you. And you know, her response was this. Her response wasn't. Let me tell you what her response wasn't at first. How dare you? Who do you think you are? What kind of man? I'm praying. And I'm pouring my heart out before the Lord. And you think I'm drunk? What's wrong with you? I'm about to leave a Yelp review on this church. I'm about to go on Facebook and let it out. I'm about to tell everybody how horrible of a person and leader you are. I'm going... If I could give you zero stars, I would. I cannot believe what you just said to me. Elkanah, husband, come here. He told me. Let me tell you what she didn't say. She didn't say none of that. Let me tell you, because listen, for us, we would have lost, we would have went nuclear. Absolutely nuclear. We would have had picket signs. I'm not drunk. We would have went crazy. She didn't do none of that. You know what she said instead? Because honor brings forth supernatural miracles. She said, sir, she's honoring the office. Even if she didn't honor what he just said, she honored the office of the man of God. This is the high priest. She said, sir, I don't think of me as a wicked woman. She was concerned about how he viewed her. Sir, don't think that I'm a, I am not a wicked woman. I am simply pouring my heart out before the Lord. Don't think of me like that. Don't think I'm doing anything evil in the house of the Lord. I, I'm just pouring myself out. I need a miracle. You know what he said? Because she didn't say, how dare you? Because she didn't say, I'm mad at you. She, because she didn't say, I'm going to leave a bad review about this church. She didn't do that. But because she said, I just want God. I just need a miracle. You know what he said? Go your way. Let the miracle come forth. And guess what? The same thing she was believing God for, she brought before the Lord a few years later after he was weaned. Listen, listen. Honor or lack of honor will dictate your miracle. Honor or lack of honor will dictate your miracle. If you're wondering, why haven't I got my breakthrough? Why isn't my marriage healed? Why isn't my children acting right? Why haven't I got what I've been believing God for? Maybe. It's because you don't honor no one else around you. Maybe it's because you don't honor God. Maybe because you got some bitterness in your heart because God ain't did it yet. Listen, his delay is not his denial. Just because he hasn't done it don't mean he won't. And, and maybe because we don't honor those who are around us, the people God has put in our life, our pastors, our leaders, because we lack honors, because we lack miracles. If you really want God to move in the supernatural, it starts with honor. Honor creates an atmosphere. Honor creates a presence. Honor opens doors that are normally closed for someone else. Amen? We need to honor again. And I want you to remember, honor is actional, not reactional. I mean, I'm going to start honoring not because someone gets me in the mood to honor, but I'm just going to honor simply because the word of the Lord that I live by tells me I should honor. I'm going to honor my spouse. I'm going to honor my children. I'm going to honor God with the money in my pocket. I'm going to honor my brethren. I'm going to honor my pastors and apostles, amen. And I'm talking about the entire pastoral staff that is here. You have amazing pastors, youth pastors, care pastors, creative pastors, what are executive pastors, assistant pastors, and, of course, amen, our lead pastors. You have amazing people that God has put in your life. Honor those. The Bible calls them gifts. Your cure group leaders. Amen. Your ministry leaders. Honor. 
Honor those, amen, that, that are there with you, laboring and fighting a good fight. Honor. Because the moment you do is the moment you open doors to the miracles you need in your life. Amen? I want you to stand on your feet with me this morning. How does honor begin? And honor begins just by valuing, having value for what God has put in your life. Come on, I look at it this way. If God gave me anything, I better value it. If God gave it to me, I better value it. I better honor what God has put in my life. Amen? Listen, I want to pray for us this morning. Before we do, I want to give this invitation out. Maybe you're here and you're not saved. You're not born again. Jesus loves you. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. My prayer is this. Don't walk out here the same way you walked in. Well, what's the purpose, amen, of walking into an atmosphere of power like this and then walking out the same way? The truth is, no matter how good we came into church, we can always walk out better. But if we especially come into church broken, lost, needing a Savior, man, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, Jesus loves you. There's hope in the cross. Come on, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says he will take your sin. Every one of them will throw as far as east is to the west. He'll throw it into the sea called forgiveness. Listen, it doesn't matter what you've done. There's hope this morning. No matter how far you fall away, there's hope this morning. Listen, look at me. It don't matter what you did yesterday. There's hope right now. So if you're here and you say, I need to release something. I need to give my heart, my life, my everything to Jesus. Listen, your family's hanging the balance. Your very life hangs in the balance on these moments. The Bible says that today is a day of salvation. I mean, you don't have to wait till tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Why? Why, why, why would you wait? Because the truth is, prom- prom- I mean, tomorrow's not promised to nobody. Today is a day of salvation. So all I'm going to say is this. Come home. Come home. Some of you served God before. Some of you never have. It's the same thing. Though. Come home. And if that's you, you say, I need to rededicate my life. I need to give my life to Jesus. I want you to do something simple. I want you to simply raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I need to rededicate my life. I need to give my life. Amen. Come on, I see hands going up. Come on, hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. Come on. Because you know the truth is this. Now tell this to my church all the time. This is the most important moment of every service. I don't care how good the message was or wasn't. I don't care about none of that stuff. All I care about is will someone respond? Will someone's life be changed today? If you lifted up your hand and said, I, I want that, I want you to come out here. She come to this altar. I'm going to get some leaders up here. They're going to pray with you. And we're going to have an amazing move of God right now. Come on. Come on. This is the atmosphere of miracles that I'm talking about. God bless you, brother. God bless you, man. Come on, sis. Come on up here. It's your first time, ain't it? It's your first time? Man, you stepped in something powerful. Come on. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Come on. You got two powerhouse women of God around you. Listen, why did this happen? Why is there four people giving their life or rededicating life? Because we chose to honor God. Come on. Honor God. Amen. Creates and breathes an atmosphere for miracles. Because what good is it? I know we like we want to see miracles. We want to see, you know, the, the deaf hear. We want to see the blind see. But what, what use is that if I can see but I'm going to hell? What use is it if I can hear but I'm going to hell? This is the miracle we need. This miracle creates the atmosphere for all other miracles right here, right now. Let God be God. But for the rest of us here, we have to shift. And we have to create an atmosphere, not for just honor up, not just for honor down, not just for honor this way, but it has to be a 360 degree type honor. That honor goes everywhere I go, honor goes with me. Amen? Everything I do, I'm going to honor God in it. So lift up your hands all over this place. Come on. All over this place. Thank you, Jesus. From the front to the back, Lord, I pray fill us up with the spirit of honor. Lord, we want the honor that we have for people 
the honor we have, Lord, for governing authorities, the honor we have, Lord God, for everything you've called us to honor. We want that to create atmospheres for miracles. We want supernatural moves of God, and we know it starts and ends with honor. So, Father in heaven, I pray, give us that heart. Give us a desire, a desperation to honor the things and people and places that you put in our lives. Forgive us for our lack of honor. Forgive us when we've complained. Forgive us, God, when we had bitterness in our heart. Forgive us, God, for when we were the hindrance to the miracles that we wanted in our own lives. Lord, it wasn't you that held up the miracle. It was us and our lack of honor. So, Father, today, this morning, we repent, God, and we pray let the glory begin to flow like never before, God, because we choose honor. We choose honor, not because someone honors us, just just because you told us we are called to. Father, bless your people. Pour out your spirit. We pray, Lord God, because of honor, because of salvation, now, God, we desire to see the lame walk. Now, God, we desire to see the blind see. Now, God, we desire to see marriages restored. We want everything you have for us, God. And we unlock it by a spirit of honor. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify you. King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the great I am. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are, God, everything we need in this morning, God. Father, we praise you, Lord God. We lift your name on high. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, will somebody give him the praise, the honor, the glory that he deserves? Come on. When we create atmospheres, honor, and miracles, we'll begin to see God move in ways we've never thought we would. God will take you places you've never been before, all because you decided, I'm going to be an honoring man. I'm going to be an honoring woman. Prepare yourself, because God's about to do some things, not only in this house, but in our entire network of churches. Amen. Come on, if you believe it, give God praise this morning. Amen. So this afternoon, you have an opportunity to honor before you leave. Greet somebody that you haven't talked to, somebody you didn't talk to in the 60 seconds. Start honoring one another in that oppor- in, at that moment. And then this evening, tonight, we will have Pastor Steve with the Cure Church Lawrence. They will be joining us tonight. We encourage you to come back and join us this evening at 6 o'clock. Thank you for joining us at the Cure Church Kansas City. Have a good afternoon.